Hi folks, welcome to our weekly chats about local history. Thanks for joining me uh, on this nice sunny day if you're watching live. Uh, this week's topic, again, I'm Rob Goller. Sorry for not introducing myself each week if you don't know me. Um, uh, and I am the town and village historian here in East Aurora, but of, uh, as just a little uh, disclaimer, these videos and a lot of my research do not um, are not part of my official duties as town and village historian. I do these on the side. Uh, but this this topic this week comes from some of my research in a, in a recent posting, I think it was on Friday, posting on the Aurora Town Historian's uh, Facebook page and, and Instagram as well, uh, is, uh, I and I've realized I'm putting, as I've talked about before, I'm putting a series of books together, hopefully a book uh, this year, of all the things that I've written before, um, a lot of the things that I've written before, and I've been making categories and cataloging all the things that I've written, all the history articles I've written, and all the research I've done. And one of the, and there's uh, tends to be um, a couple topics that I've gravitated to more so than others. One of them being um, pandemics and health-related uh, topics. Um, even before uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, where I followed up with a ton of research. I actually spent a, a lot of time because I'm in, I was intrigued by uh, how history was repeating itself. Um, so I, I wrote a lot about um, our reaction. I'm not a, a, a doctor or a scientist or uh, any of that, but I was intrigued by our reaction, the media's reaction, the community's reaction um, to uh, a pandemic or to an uh, illness in the community. And uh, so I had... Uh, eerily done some research and actually writ, writ, wrote an article and it was published in 2018 on the 100th anniversary of the Spanish flu uh, pandemic when it came through East Aurora in the fall of, of 1918 at the end of uh, World War One, and not having no idea that in two years uh, or so we'd be having uh, a pandemic of our own. Um, it was no longer part of ancient history. It was part of the present. And uh, so I revisited that um, that uh, uh, research and then it did, a, a, did a lot more and discovered that as 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 much as we refer to the we refer to the Spanish flu pandemic quite a bit, it gets a lot of attention. Um, and there were a lot of comparisons when we were in the middle of the covid pandemic to the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. And I even did an article uh, comparing the two. But there were also a lot of other uh, health-related uh, epidemics, um, health-related scares, quote-unquote, in our local communities, um, including East Aurora, that um, were just as scary to the people who lived here, and the parents especially, um, and had uh, similar reactions. Uh, but... Um, that didn't get don't get and I, I think don't get as much attention in the study of history as they should we focus a lot on the spanish flu um because that was a pretty big one actually here in east aurora it wasn't as um uh, as bad as it was in other areas uh as far as death toll and the number of patients um we were locked down for a little while uh about a month um a couple weeks at the very least, but um, we didn't really get back going up and for about a month. But that, compared to what we were doing during COVID, um, was relatively short. Uh, but there were other, uh, as I was discover, as I was researching, I was discovering there were other uh, pandemics, epidemics, uh, health um, scares in our community. Uh, uh, scarlet fever in the 1930s, um, polio, especially. Ask anybody who's um, who raised children during the polio uh, uh, epidemic of of the 1950s, um, 40s and 50s, and they'll tell you how scary it was. Uh, uh, swimming pools were closed. Parents didn't want their kids going out um, uh, and to catch uh, polio, which led to infantile uh, paralysis. Um, uh, paralysis uh, was the result in many cases, so people were scared about it. Well, last week, as I was researching, um, as uh, I've talked about before, I tend to look back at anniversary years, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and I came across a headline that said, one small case of smallpox. And actually, first I came across a little notice from the East Aurora Library uh, in 1924, March 1924. They were canceling a program involving children at the library 
um, and they were canceling, postponing the program rehearsals for this entertainment event until the smallpox scare had uh, subsided, until the smallpox uh, cases in the community had subsided. And I was like, oh, interesting. Now, I always thought smallpox, we all kind of do, think that smallpox was something in the Revolutionary War period, Civil War period, but we don't think of it necessarily as something that was still around in the 1920s into the 20th century, but it was. And so I did a little more uh, research and found another article in the Easter Advertiser that talked about um, a young uh, uh, young man who had a mild case of smallpox, uh, tested positive for smallpox, um, and he was under quarantine at his house on North Grove Street. And as a result of this one case, um, and, it, th and that's what it was, uh, they fumigated the entire school. All the kids that had uh, come into contact with this young man's family and this young man had to stay home. Um, if they had come in contact with any of the, with the young man within the previous two weeks, uh, 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 they were sent home for two weeks. There was a two-week quarantine period, and um, and they and the health officer. We used to have a, a, a East Aurora, a town of Aurora health officer. Now those things are taken, uh, but uh, those responsibilities are part of the county health department. But we had a local health officer. Um, who uh, uh, stepped up and made a statement to the Easter Advertiser, the local newspaper, and uh, so and and tried to quell the uh, the rumors that were going around. And I found this particularly particularly interesting. So what they did is they fumigated the school, um, sent, uh, and that was the school. younger students um, attended what was known as the uh, the high school at Maine and North Grove Street. There were all the all the grades there. This was before the elementary schools came along. And uh, so that section of the school was fumigated and the kids were sent home. And uh, uh, those students in that section where that young man was. So they went through a lot of, there was a lot of uh, reaction um, to this one case of smallpox. And they said it was a very mild case of smallpox. But what they also said was that they, uh, in addition to quarantining the, quarantining the students, um, they and the children and the, their families, is they suggested, um, highly recommended, of the vaccine. And as it turns out that uh, today uh, there are certain vaccines you need to go to school. Well, back then it was not mandatory. And so um, students were getting smallpox and a lot of students were vaccinated but uh, there was a group that wasn't and they actually came out with a report that said uh, that the students that were getting the smallpox were not vaccinated and so that was their argument for encouraging um, students to to get vaccinated uh, uh, to prevent them getting smallpox um, there was a debate and that was what i found interesting is that uh, the Today, we talk about the vaccine debate um, and whether or not um, during COVID, we talk, we had the political debate about vaccines. We There's still a debate about uh, vaccines among a certain group um, that get media attention. Um, that's not new. So in fact, 10 years before this case of smallpox in East Aurora, there was a, a movement uh, led by uh, none other than Albert Hubbard II, Albert Hubbard of the Roycroft's son, and Albert Hubbard II was actually the leader of the Roycroft after his father died on the Lusitania. And he wrote a very lengthy um, essay, and it was put on the front page of the Easter Advertiser, uh, arguing against vaccinations. Um, and same arguments that were used today um, against vaccinations. It's eerie how the same arguments are being made. And then they would have, they had doctors um, who would write a uh, the the medical science behind the vaccinations uh and uh albert hubbard ii was uh saying that smallpox vaccines should not be mandatory there was a movement to make them mandatory to do um uh, to be able to participate in social activities school that sort of thing same as today uh and uh he was arguing that so that was the environment at this time so you had uh, groups of people that were not getting the vaccination. And so cases would come about. So this idea of smallpox that I was thinking, I was watching a documentary about President John Adams, and there was a whole section about 
um, uh, the family getting the smallpox inoculation, um, which wasn't as safe in the early 1800s. If you research that, there was a lot of, uh, of uh, you actually getting the smallpox vaccine. Um, they didn't know as much about it. Um, and 100 years later, we were still dealing with the debate over vaccines and the cases of smallpox. Another thing that I found very interesting about this case of smallpox here in East Aurora is um, that the uh, health officer, Dr. Buffum, had to come out and say, stop it with the rumors. <laughs> uh, and this is before social media. This is before our Facebook community groups, all that sort of thing. Um, there were rumors going around the community about this case of smallpox. Uh, previous cases of smallpox in the 1800s are documented in the Easter Advertiser as well. Um, farmers, uh, uh, farmhand got it. And um, they were they were talking about um, the rumors that went around the community in 1924 about this young man and who he came in contact to, where he was. Um, was he you know, close to my child? There was a panic about this mild case of smallpox and smallpox was pretty serious um so the panic was um understood but um there were a lot of false rumors going around where this young man was what was happening um they didn't go into detail of course in the advertiser article but i found it very interesting that time and human nature has not changed that much in a hundred years that the I remember it just reminded me of when we got our first case of covid and we remember those maps and they were showing the number of cases in each community. And I remember friends of mine, um, when we saw on the news that there was a case of COVID, the first case of documented COVID in East Aurora, um, our, everyone was texting each other. It's here, they were saying. And that was that's sort of what I'm thinking was the same kind of reaction for the smallpox 100 years ago. Again, human nature has not changed much. Um, just the method of how we spread those rumors, right? We're doing it on, on Facebook and social media today, as opposed to uh, they would have had, some people would have had a telephone or just going to the market and, and talking about it um, and parents talking from the school. Um, and uh, so that's what it reminded me of is that the, that reaction to that small pox, small pox case um, of this young man um, would have maybe have been similar to what our reaction was to the first cases of COVID that were um, happening in our community. Uh, in this case with the smallpox, it, that was the only case. Um, and, the do and Dr. Buffin, who was the uh, health officer for the town of Aurora, he actually came out with a statement and they would publish it in the advertiser um, that said that um, the rumors that were circulating in the community were causing a lot of alarm that people were mistaking uh, symptoms and they were um, uh, accusing each other of things, unfortunately, um, uh, of people breaking the, the quarantines, all that sort of thing. That wasn't documented in this particular case, but during the, span, uh, during the scarlet fever of the 1930s, there were people, there was actually a report in the paper that people were arrested for breaking their quarantines because they were going out and spreading potentially spreading scarlet fever. Um, so there were a lot of rumors going around the community. And I found that very interesting that in the newspaper um, that they said that uh, that these unfounded rumors were making the, making the situation worse. In fact, the health officers in East Aurora fumigated the school. The school officials did. They quarantined everybody they needed to quarantine. The case was mild. Um, they got more people vaccinated against smallpox. And um, that was the only case that was found here in East Aurora. And oh, within a week, the whole panic had subsided. And you didn't see it again in the, in, in, in the advertiser. So the fear was, in this case, was worse than the, what was happening in reality. Um, understood, of course, smallpox would be a scary thing. So, but the fear was worse than what the, the, what the actual um, outbreak of smallpox was. And by outbreak one young man who tested positive um again we we history is repeating itself has repeated itself and i found it very interesting that this case is smallpox um and how they canceled things um and another lesson was that um we have been through this before that um, i was talking to a friend of mine i talk about my older friends quite a bit because i asked them questions um friends who have lived through scarlet fever polio um 
other influenza and epidemics, not just Spanish flu. Of course, we don't have anyone around who lives through Spanish flu anymore, um, but they just have a different perspective of of these um, uh, health epidemics and pandemics or, or the uh, panic over what isn't a pandemic um, and the rumors. So they've seen this before um, and it plays out you it could you could just look back in history and uh, the script seems to follow the same pattern um, when it comes to our reaction and that's what I said earlier that I like to study I'm not good with the actual um, science of the uh, of the disease uh, the, uh, or the viruses but I, I, I I'm very intrigued by and um, of the reaction of the people in our and our communities to that and I um, one of the biggest takeaways I've gotten from it is that we haven't changed much in how we react to these things in um, in how we how we get panic about it um, how certain people challenge the science that are is given out by the health officials um, and uh, and the rumors that get spread pretty quickly um, when these uh, pandemics start um, they take a life on of their own when in fact the actual case isn't as bad as as the rumors that are going around. So uh, thanks again for suggesting these ideas that pop up. Um, uh, again, I, I, I'm intrigued by past pandemics and health um, uh, scares in the community. Um, and I've, I'm gonna probably have an entire section of uh, one of my upcoming books on um, these sort of things, the pandemics and our reaction to it, Spanish flu, um, scarlet fever, all those things that have happened um, throughout our history because I'm intrigued by it. And I think because we've lived through it, um, it's an important thing to, to research and talk about. And I think people are interested in it because we've actually lived through one ourselves. Um, until COVID, I don't think unless you, um, there were other, other pandemics and we had West Nile virus, we had other things, but not as much here in our local community that hit right here and it impacted it us so much. Um, and so this we can relate to it now. So that's why I think it's even more important to study it. Um, thanks again for listening. Uh, again, appreciate all the support of this project. Uh, again, if you want to watch these a different way, these are on Facebook, but if you want to watch the videos on YouTube, feel free to go over there of the channel at Robert Lowell Geller. And please keep the comments and suggestions coming. Um, topic ideas are always welcome. Either put them in the comments or uh, send me a private message. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time. And thanks for keeping history alive.